Father, we thank you. We thank you that uh, you have met with us already this morning. Lord, again, I ask as, uh, as we look at your word that you will instill something in us and each and every one of us, something that is going to sit with us toward the end of eternity. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're still on 1 Corinthians. We're going to go into 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do I hear yay? <laughs> two weeks ago, we I'm not going to go through everything, but two weeks ago, we ended on 1 Corinthians 5, which was kick out the immoral brother or sister because of their persistent sin. And it's causing damage to the church, to themselves, and to the kingdom of God. Really cheerful stuff, amen? Oh, see, you're not so enthusiastic. Next week, I'm not going to be talking on 1 Corinthians due to the fact that uh, it's Easter Sunday. It might be good for us to reflect on the Easter Sunday story. I know it's Palm Sunday, and I will talk about that in light of this passage later. But interesting enough, this is the sort of last chapter where actually Paul finishes, finishes on saying the verbal uh, talk that he's been hearing, what the Corinthian church have been saying. Because from chapter 7 onwards, it's now about the things that you wrote about. So it's a nice way of ending before Easter Sunday, do you not think? It does get cheerful, this passage, by the way. Just thought you'd like to know. You will, hopefully, by halfway through this morning, feel slightly more uplifted than you have done maybe for the last few times that I've preached. I know I felt more uplifted after I prepared it. So, that's a good thing. So, let's go. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 to 8. When one of you has a dispute with another believer... How dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you are going to judge the world, can't you decide even these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. If you have legal disputes about such matters, why go to outside judges who are not respected by the church? I'm saying this to shame you. Isn't there anyone in all the church who is wise enough to decide these issues? But instead, one believer sues another right in front of unbelievers. Even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. Why not accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourselves be cheated? Instead, you yourselves are the ones who do wrong and you cheat even your fellow believers. Isn't that cheerful? So chapter 5, we had left Paul stating that uh, we shouldn't judge those on the outside of the church. Our role is to sort of judge those on the inside, to make judgment calls in regards to continuous, persistent sin. But what appears to be happening now is that wealthier members of the church at Corinth are suing each other over civil matters. It's over civil matters, and we'll come to that in a moment. Not over criminal matters. Greed appears to be the main motivation because civil matters were mainly around breaches of contracts, legal possessions, that sort of thing. How do we know it's the wealthier members of the churches? Well, it was the only the wealthy who could afford the court system back then. It was a corrupt system and the only way you won your case was really, quite frankly, by your, your wealth. It was um, sort of you sort of who you sidled up to within the courts and quite frankly the legal system there was more around the lawyers having great ability to to eloquently speak and and slap down the opposition and and, and really take them to task literally character assassinate them and that's really the only way you sort of won if your lawyer was really really good at character assassination you're in you're bound to have won the court case but it was only over civil matters. 
And what appears to be happening here is that, uh, as I said, some of the church are actually doing it, and Paul is fuming at them. I mean, let's not get away with this. He's absolutely fuming at them. How dare you? Because you're actually dishonoring the kingdom of God by what you are doing, let alone dishonoring each other. You're dishonoring the kingdom of God because it's going on in the public sphere. Please, I want you to get the idea that these are courts that are not like ours here in the UK. Okay, where really, quite frankly, you don't hear a lot about them unless it's some big juicy story that the press like to pick up on. Some are done behind the scenes, especially civil court cases. You're really not going to hear about those particularly unless you go onto the website and all you just see is between two people. But here, their court cases were done in the public market square. So the whole town knew what was going on and who was suing who. Isn't that good? Not. And if you think about it, in John 13, verse 34 to 35, Jesus commanded, love one another as I have loved you. Your love for one another will prove that you are my disciples. Well, I'm going to sue you over something you did to me. I'm going to sue you over money. It's going to go well, isn't it? That's showing love. So I can understand Paul's indignation. But the worst thing was, and this is the worst thing, they were getting non-believers to judge what's going on within a believer's community. So they can't judge within themselves, kicking out the immoral brother. They couldn't be bothered to deal with that properly. But what we'll do is we'll get outside corrupt courts to judge us. I just find that so strange. I hope you do as well. So what's the problem? Well, all this suing seems to show an underlying issue of attitude from the Corinthian church. They are a proud, competitive, assertive people, aren't they, the Corinthians, do you remember? Or demand their rights. They're absolutely concerned about their rights. And if they, they are very touchy if anyone infringed on their rights or their perceived rights. Anybody try to inhibit their freedom? Oh, they'll kick back. Doesn't happen, does it? Here today? And these led to grievances that were harbored unendingly. So you'd hold a grudge. Many years ago, they really upset me. They tried to tell me to do something that I didn't want to do. Because you imagine, that's why probably church discipline didn't happen particularly well there. And we'll come to that in a minute. Because it was like, you know that if you sort of try to discipline anybody in the church, you know they will hold it as a grudge. And they want to sue you later or get their own back at some point. I probably think that maybe made some of the church leaders really ineffective. Because they were scared that at some point it will come back and bite them right on the backside. Hmm. I wonder if that happens today. So what's our public marketplace today? What's the equivalent? Facebook. Twitter. That's our equivalent today. That's our equivalent where maybe believers are upset with other believers. Let's go online and air my grievance at that very moment. And then so then non-believers look on there and they make immediate judgment calls. Well, so much for a church showing love. This person's really upset with them. But you've got no idea why that person's upset. It might be because the church turned around and said, no, you can't have your own way. And the problem is for me, it's not about the church, it's actually about the kingdom of God that looks bad. It does down the kingdom of God when fellow believers are disputing publicly out in the open for the whole world to see. Probably nothing worse than maybe at work or in the pub or whatever, and you're a believer, and you're sitting there moaning to a non-believing work colleague or a non-believing friend, and you're moaning about the church, and now they've upset you. Really, quite frankly, it's because you've not got your own right. You've not got your way. That's the public sphere. 
Now tell me how that does the kingdom of God any good whatsoever. It doesn't, does it? Well, those in the Corinthian church and those who are like this today are of that I only follow Christ bunch. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I follow Paul, I follow Cephas, I follow Apollos, and I follow Christ. I follow Christ bunch are the ones who believe that they have got a direct line to Jesus. They don't need the church authority. They don't need to be accountable to anyone. They're accountable to Jesus. And I only listen to Jesus and do what Jesus tells me. I never test it. I never ask anybody else. And I'm just going to do it. That's that group, yeah? They could be also be classed as the Freedom Lobby group. And we'll come to them a bit later on in the chapter. But as one commentator prior puts it, the Freedom Lobby at Corinth was to lay claim to rights here, there, and everywhere in marriage, over food laws, in business ethics, in casual relationships, in public worship, in exercising spiritual gifts, even in Pacific area of fundamental Christian doctrine. Why shouldn't I do what I feel like? Was their defiant cry. And later on in 1 Corinthians, we actually look at orderly worship, etc., because there is a reason behind it. Because this freedom lobby group, this I only follow Christ and do what Christ want, were causing disarray within the church as well. Very dangerous bunch. And they exist today. And they're in every church, no doubt, today. And what for Paul is incredulous is that we're, the church just hasn't got the bigger picture in sight. Do you, do you remember we talk about that Paul, when he's writing this, he's always referring to the Old Testament because he has a much bigger picture in view. He has sort of the kingdom of God constantly in view. And what he's having a go at him saying, you are so concerned here about everyday things. You're concerned about your little world. You're not getting the bigger picture. The reason you're doing this suing is because you think you've got the right to. Because you're worried about your little world. Again, disclaimer, not having a go at British gas, but the British gas advert. The little planets, the little world, that's exactly our mentality. Looking after your little world. Well, I hate to say this to ourselves, but we don't live on little worlds. We live on one great big one that's part of one great big universe, which is part of one great big creation plan. It's called the kingdom of God. We don't have little worlds. See, when you turn off your central heating in time for summer, and it is coming, you'll remember that moment. And Paul is saying here, he says, but you're going to judge fallen angels. And you can't even judge amongst yourselves. You haven't got the mind of Christ. If you can't judge between yourselves, how at the end of time are you going to judge fallen angels? Get the bigger picture, Corinth. It's not about you. Oh, I would love to have been there. I would love to have listened if he had a go at them, I'll tell you. Now, Paul is not talking about, let's make this clear, Paul is not talking about brushing things under the carpet. Remember I said to you it's civil matters. And in years gone past, and maybe even today, Church has been able to use this passage as a sense of not taking criminal matters to court out in the public sphere. And that's why maybe people have got away with things in church life where they most certainly shouldn't have done. And it's not talking about that. And it's not talking about even brushing under something, being hurt and not dealing with it. You still need to go and deal with it. Do you know, if you've been hurt, go and talk to the person who you think has hurt you. It's quite clear in Matthew 18. Go and talk to them. And listen to them. Because it could be your fault. Just thought I'd mention that.
But what he is getting at is, goodness me, we believers are to judge the world upon Jesus' return. How can you do that if you can't judge between yourselves? And I I like this passage in Luke 16, verse 10. It gets used for the wrong things sometimes. If you are faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones, yes? But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibility. And somehow that always seems to think about money. Oh, I hear people saying, oh, you know, when I'm faithful with the small things of money, I'll get the bigger things. I've heard that in the past before. And, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 no. That's been really swapped around. It's about talents, it's about gifts, it's about everything. Yes, it will include money, but, you know, it's a much bigger picture than that. And so, Corinthian church, if you can't be faithful in actually judging between yourselves in little civil matters over money and over being cheated. What makes you think you're going to be able to judge the world with Jesus Christ? How much you think you're going to be able to judge angels? And for him, it's why not just accept the wrong done to you, shut up, move on, there's a bigger picture involved. Oh, we don't like those sorts of things, do we? But that's what he's getting at. Please remember that Paul, and we're going to come to something later on, and it's been said before, our anglicized Bible has been nicely softened. If you knew some of the real words that Paul was using, some of your ears would burn and you would shout heretic or something. And oh my life, but he used really vulgar language. And we'll describe some of that a bit later on. So if you're going to be easily sensitive and easily offended, I will warn you when we're doing it, you can do that, all right? So it's part of a bigger picture. Let's not get so upset over small grievances. You know, this was about money. This was about possessions. This was really about things that are perishable. The kingdom of God isn't perishable, is it? Amen? So... Have a bigger kingdom mind. Let's carry on. We've got a lot to get through this morning. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. There's a list of those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it seems a strange tack, because in chapter 5, we have Paul dealing with a one person's sexual sin problem. We then have Paul suddenly going on about not suing each other over civil matters. And then he seems to return back to sexual sin again. But it's not all that because we have other uh, sins in there with about drunkenness, abuse, cheating people. So he seems to be sort of doing like a wrap up here. And basically he's dealing with the seriousness of church discipline. Again, he's going on about the kingdom of God. The don't fool yourselves, wherever that is, no. Yeah, don't fool yourselves, is a real sense of noting that judgment by God is a serious matter and should be taken seriously by the church. I can imagine the Corinthians are being, oh, we're free, we're loved, and we can do anything. And it's like, don't fool yourselves. He is a loving God. That's why he sent his son Jesus to die. But he is also a God of judgment. That video uh, that, uh, that was used this morning in the worship time, that right at the beginning, that Palm Sunday, you know, he's a God of love, he's a God of compassion, all that. And I watched that and I looked and then not once was up there and he is a judge. He's a just God. It's about being just. It's about righteousness. And it was not up there. And I thought, hmm, 
We do have to bear that in mind with our Lord, because if he wasn't a just God, he wouldn't need to send his son Jesus to die. So when it comes to matters of judgment being made within the church, both theological, doctrines, policies, and discipline, then the church best take that matter seriously and not fool itself into being light-handed or hearted about the matter. Now, there's a whole list in there, and there's actually 10. If you count, the number is there, it's 10. Now, remember I said Paul's got the bigger picture? Some commentators think he's reflecting on the Ten Commandments that we're giving, and that's why he's given ten there, is because the Ten Commandments, he's trying to show a balance. Just thought we'd mention that in passing, but some of it is quite obvious, really. Those sexual sin, and we'll come into that later on, worship idols, commit adultery, are thieves, are greedy people, are drunkards, are cheating people out of their money. All those are fairly obvious, aren't they? Don't really need to unpack them. Would you like me to unpack those one by one? You're in the mood for the cheerfulness of feeling even lower than what you feel now? But I think the one that, um, given our culture today, given the last year of rule change, I just thought it might be interesting just to us to look at male prostitutes and what the NLT version quote as practice homosexuality. Two Greek words are used. Now, I'm going to try and pronounce them purely because one of them would make sense in a moment, okay? Malakoi and arsenokoyata. Where's Doug when you need him? And the last one, I will spell the first four words to you so you get the con content. A-R-S-E. Where we get our root word. <clears throat> okay. Barrett, one of our commentators, see these words as referring to the passive and active partners respectively in male homosexual relations. But the words can bring a certain amount of ambiguity if they're taken on their own. Point is, Paul put them together. This is why we have the translations that we have. And I'll just quickly go through it. Malakoi was the basic meaning of soft, but it became a slang word referring to men who were very effeminate, most likely referring to younger, passive partner in a Practice this. Pre predatorial relationship. That's what I'm going to say. Which actually, back then, was the most common form of homosexuality in the greco roman world. It was common practice for an older, wealthier, more powerful, heterosexual man to have sex with younger men. This was not to say that the sexual tendency of the older man was homosexual, but actually the reason for this was more a display of his masculinity, his power. That was the culture of the time. But then it's been added to the word that Paul's put in there, arsona katoya, no, not doing it right. And actually a bigger picture invert, uh, expands. Koitaya, okay, you ready for this? If you want to do this, might be a good idea around about now. It's a really vulgar slang term for intercourse. It's actually so vulgar, you do not see it in any common literature. It's that vulgar. It was that vulgar back then that they did not write it down that often. Okay, this is Paul, Saint Paul, follower of Jesus extraordinaire, using vulgar language. Now, that does not mean I'm expecting everybody now to walk out of here and start using vulgar language. But I think you need to get the force of what he's trying to get at. That's what Paul does. He gets to the force of why something is. There are times I must appreciate when I am preaching about something, whether it's really bad stuff or really good stuff, I would really like to let rip and let some of the words that I believe to get the force of what I'm getting at over to us all. 
And one of these days I might happen. And then you can all complain. (laughs) But as I said to you, make sure you listen to me first. But he's really trying to get over that the vulgarity and the arseno is male. It literally means. So therefore we have a vulgar reference to male on male intercourse. And this is our Paul. And if you was a 2,000 years ago Corinthian reading that and hearing that being read, boy, oh boy, you knew what he meant. So therefore then, with the two words together, male prostitutes and practicing homosexuality is translated correctly. Plus, we must recognize this. We have to look at Paul in the bigger picture. He was a Jew. He understands his doctrine of God creation theology, Genesis 1 to 3. And his understanding of Romans 1, 26 to 27, you can look it up yourselves. And the outright ban we see in Leviticus 18, verse 22, and Leviticus 20, verse 13. Paul has got a big picture about that sort of intercourse. Thank you for the tune. I'm only joking, whoever that is. These things happen. But then I hear a cry, we're in a different culture today. We understand better how, due to hereditary conditions, gene combinations, nature and nurture, awful, awful childhood, that people may be tempted to go down same-sex relations. And I'm not denying any of that. But as Pryor states, God knows the truth about these things far more precisely than any psychiatrist And any judgment he passes will be a just judgment. Yet, still it stands written, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. We need the radical honesty which asks, do we really think that the laws of God will be changed for our generation just because we are born into it? God will judge the outside. Paul's view is that God has ushered in the kingdom of God through our Lord Jesus Christ, yes? Prior states, citizens of such a kingdom are called to live in a special way. More than that, they are able, they are able to live in a distinctive way through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is therefore doubly crucial for them to be very different. I want to note here that the NLT has correctly translated it as practicing homosexuals. Might well find people who are orientated to same-sex relations, but they do not engage in it. They are not excluded from the kingdom of God. And I'm going to just unpack that as we go. It's a very sensitive subject today. I recognize that. But I want to look at this and think, well, both heterosexual and homosexual people are called to live differently for God. All of us are, amen? And when we get to chapter 7, you're going to notice that Paul talks about the potential of him being able to live alone. Live a life of celibacy. And we have... Different people have to live their life for Jesus in different ways. A heterosexual person might well be called to live a life of celibacy, even though for years they've been thinking they might get married, have children, settle down, mortgage, nice car, whatever else. But God says, no, you've now come to know me. I've actually got a different life for you. Because I need you more and more for my kingdom. Because you're going to do so much more. And we'll come to that in chapter 7 in a few weeks' time. So my quote for this is, why can't that also be the same for those who are inclined to same-sex relationships who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? I once heard, not in this church I hasten to add, a Christian who turned around and said, oh, homosexuals, they're just demon-possessed. They just need casting out and deliverance. I would not like to tell you my reaction. But let's put it this way, I probably could have been considerably more vulgar towards them than Paul is now. That is just such, in my humble view, a medieval way of looking at that. Our role is to judge those on the inside. 
to make judgment calls, etc., on the inside, not to judge those on the outside. And I know for many of us, this is a tough subject sometimes. We might have friends, family, and we question some of these things. And some people have said before now, ah, anybody, both male or female, of same sex relationships, you know, those who are inclined that way will never inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm like, where does it say that in the Bible? It's about practicing. I won't hang on that any more than that. If you've been upset by what I've said, please do come and see me later because you need to hear my heart as well. Paul goes on about inheritance here. The kingdom of God is about inheritance. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. It is inheritance. Again, Paul's got a bigger picture in mind, the Old Testament view. Paul, as a good Jew, would be looking at the concept of entering the good land. You know, when Paul says, go, uh, sorry, God says, go take possession, giving you this land as an inheritance, it's that sort of picture that Paul has got. It's your right, it's your inheritance, go get it. But you ever considered what inheritance is? When someone dies, they normally leave you a will, don't they? Or they leave a will, hopefully, that's bequeathed inheritance. You didn't earn that inheritance, did you? You got it because they loved you. Might be a parent to a child because you're part of that family and they love you and they wanted to make sure you got everything that they believe was due to you. You could be a friend or an adoptive parent and you're willed the inheritance because for them, you're part of the family in one form or another. They loved you enough to give it to you. Again, you did nothing to earn this inheritance. You just had a relationship with them. Now, we also do get families that can exclude their family members from inheritance via the same will. Because from the deceased person's perspective, there was no active, real relationship. No living relationship. So quite frankly, for those, normally what happens is you always hear that phrase, and then the vultures descend. I think when I reflected on that, I sat here and I thought, yeah. God says, you've done nothing to earn it. You're inheriting it because I love you. And if we're reflecting next weekend on Easter and our God dying for us so that we can inherit his kingdom, it's all about the relationship. Amen? You hear stories, and I'm not saying here in church, or, but you know, you hear stories, and I've, you know, over the years what happens is when maybe an older relative is just uh, sort of in, um, in their final years, and it's known, they're very ill, then all of a sudden, somebody who's never really bothered to care about them, one of the relatives, they've clearly had a big falling out, everybody knows there's been a real big rift, and, and over the years there's been a big, and all of a sudden, they, they seem to want to be caring and loving. Now, in some cases, that's really true because people want to repair the relationship. They actually realize they're in the wrong. They want to repair the relationship. But in some cases, it is the person that's trying to get in at the last minute. And maybe, maybe the will might get changed. Yeah? There's lots of smirking and nodding heads going on. Camera, do not pan at this time. Stay still on me. And some of us, I think, sometimes think that about God, that maybe I'll get in at the last minute. I, I, I won't worry about it too much. I won't worry about my relationship with him now. I'll get in at the last minute. Problem is you don't know when the last minute's going to come. But Paul here 
in this list of 10, he's making it very clear, and it's not an exhaustive list, I hasten to add, it's a list that refers to persistent relationship damaging sin. And Paul's asking you to have a, uh, sorry, God is asking you to have a relationship with him. Then you receive the inheritance of the kingdom of God. No relationship, no inheritance. Now, before everybody starts running away saying, oh, is my relationship good enough? Is my relationship good enough? We're going to come to that in a minute because that tends to be happening. Oh, I don't think I phoned properly God enough today. My case, I've not phoned my mum in the last week or so. Have I still got a relationship with my mum? Yes, I have. Haven't I, mum? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this list, which is really sounds oppressive, really sounds heavy. We then get this, verse 11. Some of you were once like that but you were cleansed. You were made holy. Now, I'm taking the whole 10 list. Abusive, cheaters, greedy, the whole lot, okay? You were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is where it gets cheerful, everyone. So pin your ears back, because this means everybody in this room, amen? amen? If you have a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, and it means to you all at home that are watching this as well, so start listening clearly. It says you were once like that. This is a past tense, the aorist tense, meaning done once and for. All. That were in English, which feels like were, or but you can pick it up again, yeah? It's not. It's done once and for all. It's that sort of word. You were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God. How? Because you called on his name. has a real baptismal ringtone about it. It talks about here lives that are transformed. You with me so far? Identities have been transformed. When you call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, your identity is changed. Amen? All right, I know we've just had the first half an hour really, really low, but I want us to really pick this up and understand this. Your identity has been transformed, amen? amen. The label of cheater, adulterer, thief, sexually immoral have been replaced by son or daughter of the living God. Ah, oh, come on. Amen, yes? Amen. You have been transformed. When you breathe in the fact that you are a child of the living God, you realize that you are no longer once what you were. Amen? Amen? So the label of that list, or whatever label you stuck on yourself all those years ago, you took on in your life, once you've called on the name Lord Jesus Christ, once you've made that call to him, come, be my Lord and Savior, come into my life, Done, once and for all. You're transformed. Your identity's changed. You're now a child of the living God. That's it. End of story. There's no mucking about. It's the same goes for you at home. No mucking about. The problem is, what happens is that the sticker that we had on when prior to coming to Christ, some of us still stick that on when we wake up in the morning. We pick up those old labels. Touch it on. Yeah, I like that badge there. That's what I was. I'll hang on to that. Thank you. That makes me feel bad. But the label that God sticks on you is my child. Transformed. No longer that lot. And I want us to pick up on that. You are no longer what you once were. 
You are now in the identity of Christ. Your life has been right and royally, royally being the operative word here, transformed by the biggest royal ever, creator and sustainer of the kingdom of the universe. If you sit there honestly just for a minute, what tag, what label did you put on yourself when you woke up this morning, when you walked out of your front door? So I'm going, oh, don't make a conscious effort. You do, you make a subconscious effort by the life that you lead, the way you think about yourself. Each of us are meant to wake up every morning and not put a sticker on us. We just let God do it. That's what inheritance is. I'm quite excited by it. I hope you are as well. Everybody's head's down. Is it that bad? But you should be excited by this. And Pryor says, to have and to be controlled by... Such Christ-centered convictions, both about the future and about the past, is essential to a healthy body life in the local church and to the individual believer's own spiritual health. When you recognize that you are child of the living God, you will forget your past and you will look to your future with a a much bigger view and with much more hope but you've got to breathe it in and it's not something you've got to try for because I come back to the fact it's inheritance it got will to you when Jesus died on the cross you didn't do anything but just turn up the solicitors and they read it to you and you went thank you very much We are free from every label the world wants to stick on you and what you want to stick on yourself. Do I get at least one amen? Do I get, yes, Pastor Warren, I'll actually take that on board from here on today. As naturally as I breathe in air, can you breathe in? Excellent. Some of us might be a bit easier for us because we've got cold. But if you can breathe in, that's the label that God's stuck on you. If you have a relationship, if you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. And if you haven't, he's going, come on, this is fun. This is the kingdom of God. I've got one more place on the wheel. Do you know why? Because it's an endless parchment. I've got penny and blanks and boy, do I want them filled. And it's signed at the end, isn't it? Do you know what it's signed? Jesus Christ, and it's red. Which means none of us did anything to earn it. Ooh, I really don't want to go into the next passage, but... Oh, but we've got to. Ah. The problem was in Corinth that this freedom label got taken far too far. Got taken far too far. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true. Though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord. And the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us up from the dead by his power. Just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never! 
And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. For the scriptures say, the two are united into one. But the Lord who is joined, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now, before we sort of sit there and think, oh, that's it, Paul's having to go, all the men, it's all the men's fault. Men behaving godly tonight, it's not, okay? Women can be included in that list as well. Sorry, my sisters. Paul returns back, continues with this concept of sexual sin. But he takes it a lot further. Now, this really, this whole next passage is about misinterpretation of what freedom means. Or, how can I put this? Taking something that's a world cultural view, taking something that's a good thing from the Bible, and then making up your own rules. And we'll come to that. Firstly, Greek culture understanding was the physical, i.e. your bodies, each of our bodies were evil. You're a walking tomb Trapping in the divine spirit. And the only time that your divine spirit is released is when your body dies. So your physical form is evil. Not much cop, all right? Now, you might be like me, sometimes wake up, look in the mirror and go, yeah, really don't like it. Sure, it could be evil. And they believed that the spirit and the body were very separate. Together, but actually very separate. The spirit wasn't affected by anything that was done to or with the body. You with me so far? And clearly this pagan understanding had infiltrated the church. Well, it would do, because it was made up of people who came from that culture. And clearly, when Paul must have been preaching, he must have been talking about how you can be free in Christ. You're free from bondage. Luke chapter 4, when Jesus read that scroll, I've come to release the captives. That sort of imagery. Yes, you've been made free. Amen? You've been made free. Remember what we said? You don't have to hold on to those labels. You're free. Amen? So you can imagine that sort of stuff going on. So you start thinking, hey, I'm free to do as I want. I'm free in the spirit. And he would have been talking about the spiritual life and the Holy Spirit residing in you and that sort of imagery. You can hear the teaching. And then he also talked to them about the fact that actually they were free from rules and regulations. If they were a Jew in the church, they were free from the rules and regulations about attending festival days and what food they can eat and going to the temple. Those regulations are now being sort of cancelled. And if you were a pagan Gentile who'd come to Christ, again, the same thing. You were free. You didn't need to go and do all these sacrifices, these other pagan temples. You were free from that. And you could eat whatever food you wanted. And we'll look at that in a later time. But Paul is saying, but you're not free from Christian ethics or theology. We are free within Christ. So in verse 12, this I am allowed to do is the first encounter that we have with the Greek word meaning authority. I have the authority to do as I please because I am free. You can hear the freedom lobby now, can't you? We are the only ones who follow Christ. We are free to do as we please. So this coupled with their concept of personal rights gives them a really, really bad, bad living out of uh, their Christ-like walk. They literally fell into the trap of saying, combination is I am free, I want my rights, what I do in my body doesn't affect anything in my spirit, therefore then I can do as I please. One of the other commentators, Fee says, being people of the spirit, they imply has moved them to a higher plane the realm of the spirit, where they are unaffected by the behavior that has merely to do with the body. But Paul is now going to state that freedom in Christ, we have 
is actually free to benefit the other, not to benefit ourselves. The freedom you have is to benefit the other, not to benefit you. Truly, Christian conduct is not predicted. And I had this well practiced. Truly, Christian conduct is not predicted. No, it's not predatory. That's it. Somebody say it, Wendy. Predicated? Is it predictive? No. Predicated. 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 Thank you. Cheers, Chris. On whether I have the right to do something, but whether my conduct is helpful to those around me. Remember, those in the freedom camp really thought they had a special revelation from Christ. They really thought that they were run by the Spirit of God and they can do as they please. What they've forgotten was they're meant to be benefiting the other people in the church. And clearly that wasn't happening. When you're trying to please yourself, you ain't pleasing anybody else. And quite frankly, you're not pleasing yourself neither because you're constantly angry that nobody else seems to be getting it. Paul is saying, yes, we're free, but we're free, but we're not slaves to anything. Not everything is beneficial. Not everything is beneficial. So I just want to get to this for a minute because this actually relates to us. By believing that the body is no good, the church believed they could indulge in anything physical because it didn't matter to the spirit. So when Paul was saying to them and teaching them, you know, you're free to eat any food you want. You don't have to go to the festival ways. You don't have to do this. This is where you get this argument about food is for the stomach and stomach for the food. They're using Paul's thing. He's saying, look, it's just food going in your mouth, goes in the stomach, and it comes out the other end. All right? Comes out of that. Really don't make a jot of difference. Okay? It's just food. Don't get hung up. What is it? Sacrifice to this idol? Or it was a temple thing or whatever. You... You're free from all that. And as a Jew, that was a big thing for him to say. I don't touch pork. So for him to say you're free to eat anything was a big thing. But the problem was that the Corinthians had taken that. They'd taken the philosophy of the world that it's okay to, that your body is evil and whatever you do with it doesn't make a jot of difference to your spirit. So they took that and said, we are then free to have sex and do whatever we want, wherever we want, with whoever we want. Because we're on a whole higher spiritual plane. What we do in the physicals makes not a jot of difference. And that's the problem. It's very easy to take something from the world, the world value, to take something that the Bible says is okay, and somehow to link the two together. So of course he's going about the stomach. They're thinking, oh, physical. Whatever we put in our stomachs doesn't make any odds. So taking the world view that the body, whatever you do in the body doesn't make any odds, means I could do whatever I want. We're free to do anything. Paul's saying, nope. And I think he was saying no a lot more than that. And we do the same in the 21st century. I'm sorry, my brothers and sisters. Sometimes we're not even aware that we are doing it. But we do the same. And I would humbly suggest we have done the same recently. Not we in Greenford Baptist Church. The problem was Paul was trying to unpack the fact that our bodies are not evil. In verses 15 to 17, he's making it very clear that actually your physical body is actually the building blocks for your resurrection body. You know, we talk about, oh, we're going to get a whole new body. Amen? It's the time of resurrection. But the body you're going to get, your resurrection body, your current body, the building blocks of that are going to be used for your resurrection body. This is clearly evident by the fact that when our Jesus Christ was risen from the dead, what was he able to show Thomas? Marks in his hands. So it wasn't a completely new body. It wasn't like, oh, we'll take the spirit out of that body and deposit it in a new body. The building blocks was his body. Now, at this point, people say, oh, what about cremation? What about this? Let's not worry about that, because if you got burnt in a fire and you was a Christian, you'll still be resurrected, yeah? I think our God's a little bit bigger 
than worrying about what we do here. But still, nonetheless, your body is building blocks, so it can't be evil. Because when God created creation in Genesis 1, 1 to 3, he said it was good. So that means he created man and woman, and therefore then your bodies are good. It may not feel like it sometimes. My right foot is killing me all day today. I've been hurt. I'm up and down. I'm in pain. Right now, I want... No, I don't want it cut off, but I want it to get better. So I'm going to put my foot up later on this afternoon. I'm going to be pampered by the cat. So, (laughs) and what Paul's thing is here is the fact that when he says, shall I take the members of the body of a man and join her to a prostitute? And the answer is no, never. It's almost like saying, when you go and do something wrong in the body, you're taking Christ and making Christ do it. That's a heavy one, isn't it? If we're all connected and we're the body of Christ, when we do something that's wrong, and I don't want to make this heavy, but I want us to recognize that actually we are making Christ do it. And actually when all of us do something, whenever one of us does in here and this immorality that he's talking about, we're taking the whole body, the whole church with us and doing it. So when I do something wrong, effectively, I could be taking you all with me to do it with me. And by the way, that works for each and every one of you. I just want to told that because this, this world view, this, this my little world, infiltrates us as church. This is another one where we take our little world, something of the Bible, and we read it all about me, forgetting we're all connected. You're all sat next to each other, but you're all connected in a much bigger way than you think. So when Paul, right from chapter 5 through to here, is talking about kicking out the immoral brother and sister at the temple, the cleansing of the church, there's a reason. Because it's portraying the kingdom of God. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. We were bought at a very high price. We're going to reflect on that next weekend, aren't we? Yeah? So when we see things about, run from these immoralities, run from uh, these, uh, these things, these sins... In other words, don't let them invade your life. When it says run from the old labels that you stick on yourself, there's a reason. When Paul's talking about kicking out the immoral brother and sister, there is a reason. You do not belong to yourself. Here he's talking to individuals at the moment. Later on in 1 Corinthians, he starts talking to us as a body. We are to run from these things. We are meant to not, and I don't want to spend our life avoiding sin, because the big thing what we do is say, I didn't sin today. I avoided this one. I avoided that one. No, no, no. Your focus is meant to be on Jesus. Run towards him. This lot naturally you flee from. Does that make sense? When you breathe in that you're the child of the living God, this stuff don't matter. But we do need to take note that our Lord is loving. But he is also a God who is a just loving God. So I, we have to hold the balance of his love, which is much bigger than anything. Well, he is love. But we do have to hold in the balance. He is a, a loving parent who says, that's, you know, that's enough. Enough is enough. And I want to get this hang because it is today Palm Sunday. And I'm going to go up here for a reason. Because I decided this is the temple in Jerusalem. Palm Sunday... Jesus rode on a donkey to great adulation, praise, worship. Yeah, here comes the coming king. Yes. The bit that sometimes we ignore that also happened on Palm Sunday is what? In the three gospels, the synoptic gospels, what did he do? He cleansed the temple. He turned over the tables. He violently got them out and said, This you've made a den of robbers. This is my father's. It's meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. That's not the lovey-covey kind of Jesus that we like sometimes, is it? 
We like the friendly one. But he's still the same, said, get it out. There's a reason, because you're no good. And that's why you got rid of the temple, because it was no good. It had lost its purpose. The temple was meant to be where heaven touches earth. Now you are the holy temple. You are where heaven touches earth. That's a label I want to keep attached to me at every turn. So this Palm Sunday, when you just think about that, Jesus coming, yay! Ooh, cleared out the temple. But that's because he made it a way for you and me to have labels from him that says, you're mine. Live a life worthy of it, focused on me. Let's pray. I want you just for a moment to consciously say to God, yeah, I breathe in the label you are sticking on me as your child. Your identity is not in what you do. It is in who you are in him. And as you do that, I pray it becomes reality for us, living reality. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.